Hi, it's an honor to be with you today. My name is Kirsten, and I'm an associate pastor at Living Waters Church in Fort Langley. Most of my life, though, I've been a campus pastor through UCM, which is a ministry that reaches out to places like UBC and SFU. I love universities, and I think they're one of the most strategic places for us to help people know Jesus probably in part because my life was changed as a university student way back in the 90s. And now you can do the math and figure out how old I am. I'm also a wife, a mom, and a daughter. And today is Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. When I think of Mother's Day, I'm profoundly aware that for some, this is a joyful day to celebrate. For others though, this is a painful day we'd rather skip. If today is difficult for you, thank you for choosing to be with us. As you listen, please know that while I got ready for today, I was thinking of you and praying that what I shared would be a gift. This Mother's Day, I am thinking about how much I miss my mom, who is one of my favorite people in the world. My parents live south of the border and we're missing each other a lot these days. I'm also, of course, thinking about my three crazy kids. They're six, eight, and 10. Our youngest, our daughter, survived kidney cancer this past summer. So I might be giving her a few more hugs than usual today. We're so grateful that she's healthy and cancer-free. But you don't need to have walked through a cancer journey for this year to have been hard, do you? When I think of where many of us are right now, words come to mind like isolated, tired, and numb. It's been a long year where we have had to navigate the pandemic alongside what was already challenging about our lives. And on top of that, the pandemic has intensified many of our normal life challenges. You could say that we're going through a kind of corporate wilderness experience. Because of this corporate experience of struggle, there are these verses that have been running through my mind and my heart like a song. They're words from God to his people when they were in the middle of a wilderness experience. And they go like this. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. It's Isaiah 43, verse 19. I keep coming back to these words because they remind me that even if I feel like the signs of hope are few and far between, God is still on the move. He's doing something. We may not see it any more than I can see some of the germinating plants in my garden right now, but the growth is there under the surface, ready to spring up in our communities, in our relationships, and in our hearts. That's what it's like with God. You know, in ancient cultures, misfortune and suffering were almost always interpreted as a punishment from the gods, but that's not our God. Our Jesus whispers in our ear, in this world, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And then he says, watch me, I'm doing a new thing. If it's been easy to feel like God has abandoned our world or you this year, know that this is not how he works because he is always doing a new thing, right in the middle of the brokenness, suffering, and evil that we see all around us. I wanna spend some time today looking at this word that God gave his people when they were in the wilderness. What does it look like when God does a new thing? Well, when God does a new thing, it shows us who he is. When life gets hard, it's easy to wonder if God is really in charge or if he cares about us anymore. That is exactly where the Israelites are in the second half of the book of Isaiah. 
Their country has been essentially destroyed by the Babylonians, and the bulk of the Jewish population has been shipped off to Babylon, the capital city of their captors. Israel was in exile. Now, Israel was a bit of a backwater at this point in history. Babylon, on the other hand, was the largest city in the ancient world, a center for culture, the capital of the farthest reaching empire of the time. For the Israelites to move from Jerusalem to Babylon would kind of been like someone who's never left Kamloops moving to New York. I can imagine them gaping at the sheer size of the city, at the display of wealth, culture, power, and at their many, many gods. Is it any surprise that when the Israelites looked around, they questioned if their God was any match for the pagan displays of power they saw all around them? Is it any surprise that as the reality of being exiled sunk in, that they questioned if their God cared for them at all anymore? When I really think about it, I hear these questions in my own heart. I read the news sometimes, and I look at the things going on in our world, and I wonder. It doesn't match what I believe about God, but if I'm honest, I have my moments where I wonder if God can do anything about what's going on in our world. And I've had my moments in the midst of struggle when God's care for me has felt like more of an abstract concept than something real. In this chapter of Isaiah, God is answering these questions over and over again. Verses 8 to 13 in this passage are actually a courtroom scene where God himself is on trial before the nations for these very questions. God's statement at the end of this section is that I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? God wants them to know in no uncertain terms that He is the only God. But that's not all God wants his people to know. He also wants them to realize that even though they're in exile, they are still his. He still loves them and he still identifies himself as their God and their savior. This chapter, chapter 43, begins with the most beautiful of declarations. And this is what it says. God says, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. This passage is actually one that God spoke very clearly to my husband, David, one night in 2015. At the time, David had no idea why. He actually shared the scripture with someone in our small group, thinking it was a word of encouragement for them. But a few weeks after God spoke these words to David, I started to bleed a lot. I was 24 weeks pregnant and no one wants to start bleeding when they're 24 weeks pregnant. After 11 days in the hospital, our daughter was born, 15 weeks before her due date. She weighed 1,000 grams and was whisked to the NICU the moment she was born. We named her Joy. We now know that these verses were for us, or for her, the following four months were scary, emotional, and exhausting. When a baby is born at 25 weeks, they're called micropremies, and the list of things that can go wrong is overwhelming. But the fire did not burn her, and the waters did not overwhelm her. 
The number of complications Joy did not have is miraculous, actually. Joy is six now. She is in kindergarten. She is vibrant, healthy, hilarious, and she lives up to her name. God's power and protective loving care are not always as easy to see as they are in the story of, G of Joy's birth. As people, many of us walk through deep pain and there are no easy answers as to why some experience loss and others do not. I share our journey with Joy though, because it is a beautiful picture of both the power and the love of God. The way the Lord works in each person's story is unique, but for each of his people, his intention is the same. To love us, to care for us, to call us his own. I also tell you this story because we didn't want Joy to be born at 25 weeks. And it reminds me that sometimes God, when God does a new thing, it is often not what we expect, but it doesn't mean that God isn't working in our lives. When God says in Isaiah 43 that he is going to do a new thing, he's actually referring to a specific way that he is going to save his people. What's interesting is that what he did was something that the Israelites really didn't like. The good news was that God was going to lead them out of exile. The bad news was that he was going to use a Persian king named Cyrus to do it. We might look at this and wonder what the big deal is, but nothing could have been more of an affront to the Jewish people than to be rescued by an outsider, a non-Jew. They didn't realize that God's ultimate plan, his ultimate new thing, was greater than their narrow understanding of what it meant to be God's people. And when another savior came hundreds of years later and brought into being what I'd call the ultimate new thing, when God himself came as a man, and when Jesus died on a cross to make an ultimate new way for all people to know God, they didn't like that very much either, did they? When Jesus came, his message was offensive to almost every religious leader in Israel. They had waited for the Messiah for hundreds of years, but no one was expecting a suffering Messiah. It would seem that when God does a new thing, when he acts, it often doesn't look the way we expect it to look. It may surprise us. It may offend or disappoint us. It might not at first glance look anything like a blessing at all. I have found this to be true so many times, and it reminds me of one of the most formative journeys of my early life, which was my journey through singleness. One day in first grade, I stood in front of my mom, like I meant business, and said, Mom, when I get older, I am going to arrange for a husband, and then I'm going to have babies. I was totally into the marriage and family thing. But, there was a dearth of prospects and I lived through my 20s with a very great fear that I would never meet anyone. When I was in my 20s, I kind of, late 20s, I kind of hit bottom in my life and God asked me a question. He said, what do you want? I want to get married, I said. I want to have a family. And then God asked, what else do you want? It was a very difficult question for me to answer because I had no idea. And that question was not what I wanted from God. But I began to pray to try to figure out what else I might want in my life. This was the beginning of me learning to live the full life that I had no idea I wanted. I saved money. I moved an hour north to Vancouver and started a grad degree at Regent College. I started to take myself more seriously as an artist. And as I looked at the Bible, I didn't feel like there was any kind of promise that I would get married. 
but I did feel like there was a promise that I could, as a believer, have a rich relational life. I tried to build that kind of life. God asked me what I wanted in 2001, and I didn't meet my now husband, David, until 2007. But in that time, I became a different person, a more whole person, more the person I was meant to be. In those years, God built things in my life that are great gifts to me now. I wanted something different, but I needed to walk the journey God had laid out for me. When I think of how God works, I'm often reminded that He is God and I am not. He is in charge, and thankfully, I am not. I am often reminded that with God, I need to expect the unexpected, but I need to trust him because he knows what he's doing. I wanna end by talking about how when God does a new thing, it's often where we least expect it. It's often in the wilderness. In the midst of trouble and hardship, it's easy to wonder where God went. But the reality is that God, with God, is that he is often working the most when our lives are the hardest. This passage that we are talking about today is a word spoken to a people who are in the wasteland. And because of this, it is a word that can be powerful to us in this time. The wilderness is that place where we feel lost, where there seems to be no way out, where we are vulnerable and scared and alone. The wasteland is that dry place where nothing grows, where there is no food, no life, no hope. Sounds a bit like COVID sometimes, doesn't it? God says that he is doing a new thing here. He is making a way through the wilderness and he is causing water, abundant, life-giving water to flow in a dry wasteland. So God is saying that he is doing a new thing in the hardest place, the place we didn't think we could get through, the place where there was no life. And this is what God does. In fact, I would push things a bit further and suggest that some new things that God wants to do can only come to life in the wasteland. I believe that God has been doing something in and among his people over the past months that he couldn't have done any other way. A deep work in our hearts, a work that will lead to a deeper reliance on Jesus a greater refreshing from his spirit, a deeper healing. Because that's what I have found God does when we're in the wasteland. In my life, I have found that it's my wilderness journeys that have taught me to cry out to God. Where my prayers have moved from being surface requests to gritty, painful, and honest cries from the depths of who I am. The wasteland is where God has been able to do deep work on my character. When my kids were really little, I felt like the physical demands of caring for them was relentless. I was so tired. I remember joking in those years that I had joined the secret service because I was learning how to serve secretly in ways that no one but my infant and my two-year-old saw. But in those years, God built new strength in me, strength I still draw on. I'm not saying that everything difficult in our life comes from God. In a broken world, that is certainly not true. But the beautiful thing is that any wilderness, any wasteland can become redemptive in the hands of our gracious, loving, and redemptive God. What has God been doing in you. If you feel like you've been struggling through a wasteland, know that nothing has been wasted. Don't be fooled by the emptiness or wildness of your surroundings. Our God is at work 
right where we are. My husband David said something once that I have never forgotten. He said, life has been so much harder than I thought it would be, but Jesus is so much better than I thought he would be. And that's what I love about Jesus. I know that it is in the living water of Jesus in my life that has helped me through every wilderness and wasteland, through what we're walking through right now. And I want to end today by extending this same invitation to you. If Jesus is someone you've learned about but have never gotten to know, this could be the day where he could do a radically new thing in your life, where he could make you his own. There is a moment in the book of John where Jesus says, whoever believes in me will have rivers of living water flowing from within them. This is the promise that Jesus makes, that if we will believe in him, the living water of his presence will enter our hearts. If you would like Jesus to do this new thing in your heart today, would you pray with me now? Lord Jesus, Jesus, we just come to you um, wanting to know you. Um, Jesus, when we look at our lives, when I look at my life, I can see what happens when I try to lead my life. And um, Lord, I just am realizing that I can't do that. Jesus, I see the ways that I, I hurt other people, that I hurt myself, and that I hurt you. And I want you to know that I'm sorry. Jesus, I think about what you said about if, if we believe in you, rivers of water will enter our life. And that's what I want. Jesus, I believe that when you died on the cross, you made a way for me to be clean. You made a way for all of the brokenness in my life um, to be wiped clean, for me to have a clean slate. And that's what I want. I come to you, Jesus, and ask you to enter my heart. And I ask you, Jesus, to do a new thing in me. I want you to be in charge of my life. And I give you my heart right now. Thank you, Jesus, that you have made a way for me to become a new creation. Thank you that you call me your own.